Edmonton Baptist Church. As you probably know, we're not holding any services in the building, so this is a live stream via Facebook. Hello out there to you all in Cyberland, and greetings to those who will get a CD or watch the recorded service later on today or maybe tomorrow. I encourage you to engage with the worship. Remember, it's not a spectator sport. Join in and fully worship our true and living God. Now, we have a few notices, and I'll just go through them. Very important for church members, voting for the election of deacons is now underway. The closing day is Wednesday the 25th, and unfortunately, any ballot papers received after that date can't be counted. So I urge you, as quickly as you can, tomorrow, uh, call into the office to pick up a ballot form and return it soon after. Or, as an alternative, you can ask for one to be emailed to you. You vote and you email it back. Remember, we must have all the forms back by Wednesday. The church meeting is the next day, Thursday the 26th. And I just um, stress that it's going to be at 7 o'clock via Zoom. I repeat, the church meeting will be on Thursday the 26th at 7 o'clock. There is no meeting in the building. And the election of deacons will be concluded then. Please don't miss out. This is a very important part of our church life get your ballot papers, vote and return as quickly as you can, not later than Wednesday. Our last uh, bit of information is next week, Sunday the 29th, is the first Sunday in Advent. And it begins a period when we anticipate, we prepare spiritually and really remember the true meaning of Christmas. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather to serve you and to thank you for all you have done in our lives. We know you as the only true God. Accept our thanks and praises in Jesus' name. Today is the day that you have made and we rejoice in it. Heavenly Father, as we continue this service, fill us with your unlimited joy and refresh our spirit. Amen. And now our call to worship, Psalm 148, reading from verses 1 to 6. And we will read together, the few of us who are here. Please join in from your places at home. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from heaven, you that live in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels all his heavenly armies. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, shining stars. Praise him, highest heaven and the waters above the sky. Let them all praise the name of the Lord. He commanded and they were created. By his command, they were fixed in their places forever, and they cannot disobey. Praise be to God. Now we're going to continue with our worship. We're going to be honoring the name of Jesus, and we will listen and see a video from Ron Kenoli. Hallowed be your name. And I'm honored to sing your praise. King of glory, God Almighty, hallowed be your name. All creation, every nation has 
Hallowed be your name. I now invite Joyce Lynn to lead us in our intercessory prayers. Thank you. Today, as a church, we join with God's people all over the world in the worship of God our Father. We will give thanks for his mercy and ask for forgiveness for her sins. And as his word directs, we come in faith believing as we boldly bring the petitions for our world before him. Let us pray. 
God our Father, creator of our world and Lord of our lives, we praise you. We thank you for the gift of prayer and your promise to answer when we call. Help us to confess our wrongs as we ask for your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, for the recent vaccine breakthrough and ask that you continue to guide those involved in this development, that they follow the path of integrity in all they do. Today, we also pray for peace in so many areas of war, civil unrest, displacement of peoples, and the ever-increasing rise in those forced to seek refuge from dangerous circumstances. We thank you for all the aid agencies who seek to alleviate suffering, and we pray for financial support for them. We pray that quiet acts of bravery, kindness, and love continue to minister to those in need. As the pandemic continues to ravage our world, we bring before you the global situation, and we pray especially for those areas where medical services are very poor. We commit to you those working in such areas Give them courage and the will to persevere. Lord, we also bring before you, in the silence of our hearts, those known to us who are suffering in pain and in grief. Those who are fretful and anxious, those who have lost their jobs and feel unable to cope. We pray for hearts of generosity and compassion that we may help them. We continue to pray for those who work for the restoration of health and well-being, for their protection, good sense, and the strength to continue to do good. And finally, we we commit our worship to you today. Help us to hear from you as your word is delivered to us. May all those who listen find you and the life you offer. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Joycelyn. And as is our custom, Andrea is going to come and give us some information about a country, and we're going to also pray for that country. Andrea. Good morning, everyone. Today we will go to, to our next country. I'll give you a few seconds to give it a thought what country we are looking at today. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, I prepared by mistake another country with the same color. So next week you will have the same colors again for another country. Today we look at Poland. Now, when I, st I started to look for Poland, the meanings of the flag, I couldn't find out what is the meaning of the flag because that looks like it's not a real meaning of it, but there is a story behind it, a legend. However, this is what I found out. If we look at Christianity, the white represents the purity and the red represents love. The legend of the Polish eagle states that the first settler of Poland saw a white eagle landing in front of a red sunset and used that as a sign that they should settle there. Nowadays, it's commonly speculated that the white color stands for the hope for peace. Meanwhile, the red refers to the bloodshed that happened in the many wars that Poland was involved. Poland is situated in Central Europe 
and is bordered by the Baltic Sea, Germany to the west, Czech Republic and Slovakia to the south, and Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania to the east. The climate is temperate with warm, sometimes very hot summers, crisp sunny autumns, and cold winters. Snow covers the mountains area in the south of Poland and from mid-December to April, and rain falls throughout the year. The population is over 38 million. The economy of Poland is an industrialized mixed economy with a developed market that serves as the sixth largest in the European Union and the largest among the former Eastern Bloc members of the European Union. Poland remains one of the world's leading producers of rye and potatoes. Other principal crops include wheat and sugar beets. Poland is relatively well endowed in natural resources. Its principal mineral asset is bituminous coal, although brown coal is mined as well. Sulfur is Poland's second most important mineral and the Republic ranks among the world leaders in both reserves and production. Religion. During the Golden Age in the 1500s, Poland became a bulwark of Christendom, aiding in the establishment of the church against inv invading Muslim Turks. Several centuries later, it was the Catholic Church that kept Polish culture from crumbling under the communist regime. The Catholic Church still holds sway over Polish culture, but personal faith is nominal and morality is being chipped away from the foundation of Polish society. There is a desperate need for evangelical, evangelical witnesses, with 90% of the municipalities having no church. Pagan, Vican, and New Age religious are gaining followers, and there are two Jehovah's Witnesses for every evangelical. Landscape. The Polish landscape is very diverse. Due to the many elements that, uh, that have formed it, volcanoes, glaciers, water, and wind have created beautiful scenery across the whole of Poland, starting from the mountains in the south through the central lowlands to the Lake District, Masuria, and Baltic Sea in the north. Buildings, here are a few buildings and a beautiful one in the mountains for those who would like to travel but we cannot. Traditional clothing, Dinolingo traditional Polish clothing is very colorful and decorative. In fall costume, women wear long colorful skirts with ribbons and printed with large flowers. Interesting facts. The name Poland, Polska, originates from the name of the tribe Polany, which means people living in open fields. Marie Curie, the woman who discovered Poland and Rad, wasn't French, but Polish. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize the first person and only woman to win twice and is the only person to win a Nobel Prize in two different sciences. Poland has an impressive 16 World Heritage Sites and among them the biggest castle in the world, Malborg, measured by area. Located in Wroclaw, the Pivnica Swidnica is the oldest restaurant in Europe. Open since 1275, you can still eat there today and some prayer points. To pray for Catholics to focus on the redemptive work of Christ on the cross and the personal relationship that he desires. To pray for the hearts open to the message of salvation among the materialistic youth. We pray for more national missionaries to take the gospel to other Slavic nations. Let us pray. Father, we come before you and once again we thank you for Poland. We see the diversity, Father, that you have created. We see the beautiful nature, Father, and all the resources that you place there, Father, for the people to be able to, to have a good life, Father. We pray for the government and we pray for a good stewardship of everything that you gave them. Father, as we look to history, Father, we see, Father, how religion was fighting against oppression and against communism. And today we look that the majority are Catholics, Father. Father, we pray, Father, for 
your love, Father, to penetrate their lives, Father. We pray, Father, for a new vision for them, for a new direction, Father. We pray, Father, for a revival in Poland, Father. We pray, Father, for missionaries, Father, to go, Father, to these countries in Europe, Father. They are, they are in Europe, and many times we see, Father, that actually majority of them, they are not even Christians. Father, let, let not call us just Christians and go along with it, but understand, Father, that Christianity is a relationship with you, Father. I pray, Father, for the Polish people that they will find you as their father. They will have the relationship with your son, Father, and they will dedicate their lives, Father, for better works, Father. We pray, Father, for hearts open to the message of salvation, Father. And we pray, Father, for more national missionaries, Father, to take this gospel, Father, not only to Poland, but to all the countries, Father, where there is a need, Father, a need for your peace and comfort among the people. Amen. Let us not be weary in doing good. Let us continue to pray for the nations of the world. We need prayer, and we need it for every country. Our Bible reading, Catherine is going to come and read for us. Good morning, church. Our reading today is in the New Testament and the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 to 16. To have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. It was by their faith that people of ancient times won God's approval. It is by faith that we understand that the universe was created by God's word, so that what can be seen was made out of what cannot be seen. It was faith that made Abel offer to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, he won God's approval as a righteous man, because God himself approved of his gifts. By means of his faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. It was faith that kept Enoch from dying. Instead, he was taken up to God, and nobody could find him, because God had taken him up. The scripture says that before God, Enoch was taken up, he had pleased God. No one can please God without faith, for whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seek him. It was faith that made Noah hear God's warnings about things in the future that he could not see. He obeyed God and built a boat in which he and his family were saved. As a result, the world was condemned and Noah received from God the righteousness that comes by faith. It was faith that made Abraham obey when God called him to go out to a country which God had promised to give him. He left his own country without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in the country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God. For Abraham was waiting for the city which God has designed and built, the city with permanent foundations. It was faith that made Abraham able to become a father, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself could not have children. They trusted God to keep his promise. Though Abraham was practically dead, from this one man came as many descendants as there are stars in the sky, as many as the numberless grains of sand on the seashore. It was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. 
Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was a better country they longed for, the heavenly country. And so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God, because he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It's uh, good to see you. Uh, very strange. We're kind of in a in between two worlds today. We have a very small congregation of God's people who are leading this service, and we're allowed to do that. But also, we're speaking to you all out there, and it's wonderful to be able to do that. Uh, I have reflected, and we were praying before this service started, to remember that in our frustration as Christians here in this country in our lockdown um, that there are many countries of the world where the Christian faith is persecuted it may be that there is somebody in a country right right now watching this service and our hearts go out to you because every day every week every month you experience not being able to meet together freely and our hearts go out to you we have tremendous freedom Uh, now we're talking to people on the internet and on our telephones and we're we're the people of God, regardless of our circumstances. So it's great to be here. I'm glad to see a few of my brothers and sisters in person. And uh, my wife and I were actually able to sit together in church this morning, probably one of the few times we've done that in 42 years of ministry, because so often I'm up at the front and she's down there. So I do praise God. Hebrews chapter 11, we've been looking at Hebrews recently. And uh, next week we'll be thinking about the coming of Christ, and so we'll be suspending our Hebrews uh, topic. But today we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, which is all about faith. And what a wonderful chapter it is. Uh, I had to smile as my wife was reading the chapter. Uh, I always think about Abraham, who in faith left home without knowing where he was going. I mean, how weird and strange is that? Now, I don't know what he said to his wife at the time. I'm just going out, dear. And she must have said, well, where are you going? And he must have said, well, I don't actually know, but I know that God's told us we've got to go somewhere. Um, Faith does amazing things, and uh, faith involves a thing called risk. But this is the Bible's great chapter on faith. And it's a wonderful directory, isn't it, of God's saints from the past who pleased God because they had faith. And it says very clearly that without faith, we can't please God. They had faith in God. Now, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13 lists faith as one of the paramount virtues of of the Christian that lasts forever. He says there are three things that last forever, faith, hope, and love. So that's how important faith is to the whole scheme of things. But if I were to ask you the question, what is faith? Uh, You may struggle exactly to put into words what you half know inside. It's one of those words we, we band about a lot as Christians and we call people to have faith. And yet, um, To put it exactly into words is quite difficult. So the chapter begins by giving us a definition, which is really, really helpful. It says this, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And this is what the ancients were commended for. So I ask the question first, what did the saints listed here hope for? And it does tell us, Verse 10, we heard it read, Abraham was waiting for the city which God had designed and built, the city with permanent foundations. So what did the saints listed here hope for? The city designed and built by God, the city with permanent foundations. 
Verses 13 to 16, we heard read, it was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. And those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was a better country they longed for, the heavenly country. And so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God because he has prepared a city for them. So, first thing I want to say, I want to say three things this morning. What do these verses tell us about faith? Well, the first thing is this. They could not have had either the insight or the certainty about the things they hoped for from their own imagining and thought processes. Therefore, faith is actually a gift from God. First of all, faith is a gift from God. God initiated faith in them. God placed faith in them. It was about a relationship with him. And it's important to note this, I think, as the first point from this passage. Faith is not primarily something that we work up in our own strength. Often faith is presented in that way. Faith is not something we do that makes God give us rewards or persuades God to do whatever we would like him to do for us. Uh, our previous youth pastor used to call this the vending machine type of faith. You pop your faith in the slot, and then you press the thing that you want, and there it is, it comes out from the little drawer at the bottom. But is that what this passage says about faith? Hebrews 12, verse 2 uh, makes it very clear that Jesus is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. If you have a different version of the Bible, you might have known this verse as Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So he placed faith in us. He gave it to us as a gift in the first place. It's so that we can have a relationship with God. Uh, one commentator uh, has put it like this. The casual reader might conclude from verses 1 and 2 that faith creates the things we hope for. In other words, our faith makes things happen that we want to see. Now, faith as we see it described here does not give substance to the things we hope for. It gives us assurance of the things that are already a reality. Uh, you may have to rerun this and listen to it again on the recording to get hold of what I'm trying to say from these verses. Um, so the first thing to get hold of is faith is actually a gift from God. It's not something we generate from ourselves. And these ancients couldn't have foreseen the things that God had promised them had he not placed faith in them in the first place. I hope you can see the point. Second point then is, what was it that they were certain of yet could not see? Seems a logical question. If they had hopes and, and uh, things that, that they could see, they could imagine, what was it they could see? Well, we touched on it earlier. What they were certain of and what they hoped for was the city of God that he had prepared for those who had faith. Uh, let's say that again. It was the city of God that he had already prepared for those who have faith. God had initiated faith in them. The Holy Spirit had planted insight into their hearts of what God had planned for them. And that in itself is a wonderful thing, isn't it? How would we ever imagine how wonderful it was to be there with God in heaven if the Holy Spirit had not come to live in us and planted that faith, that insight. And there, of course, are some wonderful insights that the Holy Spirit gives the ancient people long before Jesus came along. Jeremiah talks about the new covenant, the day when the law would be written on our hearts and not just in a set of rules and regulations. How did he know that? He didn't sit there thinking, oh, now, what can I think of that might happen in the future? 
the Holy Spirit placed in him this tremendous insight into what God had prepared and planned for those who love him. He may not even have really known what he was really saying, though in his heart and in his spirit, his spirit came alive as he gave us those wonderful insights. Um, now, this world, they say, was not their home. They were on a journey to a better country. They, they hoped, because in this world they did not see what they knew God had prepared for them. The Spirit of God gave them faith and insight to see what was ahead of them. This better country, their hearts, their lives, their destination was driving towards what God had prepared for them. But of that final destination, the eternal city of God, they were certain. Uh, I've often said in the past in sermons that when the word here uh, we read as hope, we have a very weak view of that word hope. We think, oh, well, I hope it won't rain today because I want to go outside for a walk. Or I hope I might be rich one day. Or I certainly hope I won't be poor one day. It's, it might happen, it might not. Here, this, is, this hope is certain. The hope bit is that we are waiting for those promises. We know that they are certain and sure because God already has planned for them. The hope bit is that it's for a time yet to come. So of that final destination, the eternal city of God, they were certain and they exercised their faith that was genuine accordingly. And of course it led them into all amazing experiences of encountering God and, and hearing his voice and obeying that voice and world-changing things in some of those people's lives which goes on still today when faith takes hold. Their faith did not give substance to their hopes, we're told. Their faith gave them complete assurance because the substance, i.e. the future city prepared by God for those who love him, is already a reality. It's a bit like, you know, the wedding preparation. Somebody's already doing wedding preparations for a time in the future. The deposit is paid, the venue is fixed, and so on. And it's going to be a reality. I hope this is making sense so far. Um, let us remember that this letter was written in the first place to mostly Jews who had put their faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah, and as a result were being persecuted. They were under the cosh, they felt oppressed, they felt challenged. They wondered perhaps on some days whether their faith really was real. So this letter would have been a tremendous encouragement to press on because the final destination is now never in question. It is certain. That's a wonderful hope that we can grasp hold of today. If we moan about COVID and all of us are feeling oppressed in one way or another, some of you out there have experienced very sad losses and sicknesses in your families. And we do pray for you uh, from this church regularly, both in general and in specific families that we know have lost those that they love. But they were certain of, and they hoped for, the city that God had already prepared for them. That was the nature of their faith. So the third point I want to emphasize is it's about inheritance. This passage is really about inheritance. I think probably a couple of weeks ago we introduced the idea of someone writing their will. I don't know if you've written your will out there yet, but you might have put something in your will like, uh, when the time comes, I want to leave my grandchildren a thousand pounds each. And you do have the good grace to tell them that when I'm no longer here, you are each going to get a thousand pounds from my will. And they might say, ooh, that sounds good. So it's written as a legal document. It is enforceable by the law. And the grandchildren from that day on know that they have an inheritance. And that at a particular time in the future, they will receive this gift of a thousand pounds. They are certain it's going to happen because it's in the will 
but it is not theirs today. Um, disappointing, perhaps, <laughs> if you've been told you're going to inherit a thousand pounds. But wonderful to know that it's there in black and white, it's legally enforceable, and it is definitely going to be there at a time in the future. So what will be ours spiritually is certain. But the full experience of that is for a time in the future when Christ comes again. You see, Jesus uh, come into this earth and we're about to remember and celebrate and reflect on this from next Sunday through until Christmas. And it doesn't matter whether we can meet or not, the truth of Jesus breaking into our world with the love of God for every human being is solid and sure. Jesus coming to earth was the pivotal point of history. From the beginning of creation to his coming is one period. And then Jesus' life on earth, this was the pivotal, pivotal point. And now we are living in what the Bible calls the last days. In the final period of history until Jesus comes again. So Jesus coming to earth was the pivotal point of history. And we're living in the final period of history until Jesus returns. Verse 4, following, and we heard many of these stories written, and I encourage you to go and read the whole of Hebrews chapter 11. It's a wonderful chapter. Um, these are stories from Genesis, from Exodus, from Joshua, from Judges, Faith in God is what keeps God's people pressing on whatever happens to us in life. And whatever happened to those people in life, and you can read their stories, some of them are quite horrific. There were saints of God who were unnamed, who were sawed in half, it says. There were all kinds of things that happened to the saints in the past. Some of the things that happened were wonderful in their lives because they were on this great adventure of faith with God but many of them were hard-pressed and uh, very bad things happened to them. But faith in God is what keeps God's people pressing on whatever happens to us in this life. Because we know, we know by faith that our inheritance is certain and guaranteed. Uh, there's a member of my extended family who is always arguing with me and he says, you cannot know. You might think, you might believe, you might hope something will happen. You can't know. And I say, that's because you don't know. <laughs> and because you don't know, because you haven't received this gift of faith from God and you haven't exercised that faith in your life, when you exercise that faith that he's placed in you, then you know. These people knew. They were certain that they had an inheritance that was guaranteed. And this is what kept them pressing on. And although bad things happened to many of them, there was a tremendous sense that they were going somewhere that was far better, that this place in which they were living now was just a temporary place that they were passing through um, because the outcome is certain and guaranteed and they knew it by faith. The saints of old exercised faith. They pressed on regardless of these terrible things that happened to some of them, inwardly convinced and confident of what God had prepared for them. And that inheritance will be theirs. Because it says God is pleased to own them as his own. And it will be ours by faith in Christ. See, this world is not our final destination. We are not at that final destination yet. What God has prepared is our true home. And let me assure you, it will be ours. That's what the scripture says in so many places. You remember what Jesus said as he left his disciples, soon before he left his disciples, John chapter 14, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I have gone there to prepare a place for you. Isn't that wonderful? It's already written. It's already certain that that's where we're going. How can we get through today? Because we have faith and because we know that our destination is certain. 
Now, there is a kind of false hope that skirts around this word faith. There's a false hope that says you can have all of heaven here on earth if you have enough faith. Uh, One of the questions I want to ask is how much is enough? Is 20% faith enough? Is 50% faith enough? Is 95% faith enough? I don't know that the Bible has an answer to that question. I don't think it's actually an appropriate question. Because true hope that comes from faith will allow you to live knowing with certainty that God already has an eternal future planned for you and for me through his Son. And if you're thinking, well, Pastor Stephen is playing down what we'll have on earth, I will say this, yes, we will have tastes of heaven here on earth. I've been a minister 42 years and I have had, over those years, many wonderful tastes of heaven here on earth. Yes, we will see some amazing answers to prayers. Believe it or not, over 42 years, I've seen some amazing answers to prayers. Yes, we will see miracles of healing and God's provision for our needs. Yes, I have witnessed and God has called me to be a partner when I've seen wonderful miracles of healing, physical healing in people's lives, healing of their whole lives, and provision for our needs. How many of us have been so blessed by wonderful, miraculous interventions of God at those times of real need. I was thinking to one of my human heroes, we shouldn't really have human heroes, should we? But many of you will know that my wife and I were quite involved with uh, the vineyard movement some years ago, and their leader, he was a reluctant leader really, because he was dragged over here from America by a, a British Baptist, surprisingly, and uh, his name was John Wimber. And uh, over a period, uh, the Holy Spirit act, acts almost in peaks at different times for different seasons. And over many years, there's been uh, revivals that where amazing things have happened for a period of time. And uh, under the ministry of John Wimber, we witnessed many miracles. Uh, and many healings over a period of time. And then uh, John Wimber, he came and he told uh, the world that he had throat cancer. And uh, the last time I heard him speak, he stood before us and he, he was thin, he'd lost a tremendous amount of weight, and every few seconds he was spraying his throat with a spray that was made from uh, the glands of a pig. He pointed that out to us. This is what I have to do so that I can carry on speaking to you because my own saliva glands have been disabled by the treatment for the throat cancer. And uh, of course everyone was very shocked to see him like that because he had prayed for and seen so many people healed wonderfully. God had answered the prayers uh, for many people who were sick. And this is what he actually said. He says, I wanted to say this before God finally takes me. I want to say that I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And I want to reassure you, it's not so bad because Jesus walks that road with you. And it wasn't long after that that he he died. Uh, I actually felt it amazing me personally. I never actually got to sit down in a room and have coffee with this man. But uh, I felt like he was one of my many spiritual fathers. And I was very sad to hear that he'd passed away. But what made me also very sad was after his death, there were some Christians who mocked him and said, oh, he's the healer who was supposed to have healed many people, but he couldn't heal himself. Does that sound biblically familiar? (laughs) I hope it does. That's what they said to Jesus, wasn't it? Um, When he was hanging on the cross, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Um, There were many Christians who said, he shouldn't have got sick and died. If he'd had enough faith, he would still be alive. Um, How wrong that is. How wrong that is. What a false impression of faith that gives. You see, the full banquet of heaven will not be ours until Jesus comes again. I would like it all today. 
I pray regularly for people to be healed. Some are healed, some are not. I pray regularly for God to intervene to, to provide money for those who need it. And there are wonderful stories I could tell and you could tell about how God has answered those prayers. We are receiving the tastes of heaven since Jesus came to this earth. There is no question. The works of the Holy Spirit have never stopped. God has always been doing wonderful things in every generation. But the full banquet of heaven will not be ours until Jesus comes again. Read Hebrews 11, it's so clear. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14, talks about God's plan for us. This is what he says. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the time reaches its fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That's the plan. That's the thing we can be certain of. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. That's such a wonderful passage, but what it's saying is this is going to be put into effect when the time reaches its fulfillment. In other words, when Jesus comes again, everything will be complete. But until then, we are marked by the Holy Spirit living in us, and therefore we can be certain that the inheritance is guaranteed and it will be ours. And that gives us strength for today. It gives us encouragement for today. It gives us hope for today. It encourages us to go on believing that we can be partners with God and see amazing things happen. Um, I'm sure you could write a, a book about your own life. It may not have had dramatic things here and there, but you can tell the story of how God, you've seen God do wonderful things around you. Um, I would love to write a book about the things that God has allowed me to be a partner with him. Though I am fearful that if I wrote it down, I might lose the blessing of just how wonderful it's been. Um, wonderful and encouraging is to read those famous words in Revelation. It's a pity we only read them often uh, at times of funerals, isn't it? Because they are wonderful words. And if you want to know the truth of this, this is what it says, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared. In other words, it's not about this, it's about what is coming. And the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. And I heard a, a loud voice speaking from the throne, now, now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Then the one who sits on the throne said, and now I make all things new. He also said to me, write this, because these words are trustworthy and true. Oh, how wonderful those words are, aren't they? It isn't just he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. He will wipe away all tears from your eyes. All those things that have grieved you so much. This is what is ahead for us. Isn't it wonderful? Um, if you're tempted to give up following Christ for whatever reason, uh, read Revelation 21, verses 1 following. How wonderful it is. This is certain and sure. Faith makes it so. The faith Hebrews 11 is telling us about is not the faith that says the harder you believe, the more you can make things happen. Faith is what the, 
what prompted the suffering man Job in the Bible to say, I know that my Redeemer lives. He goes on to say, and on that day he will stand in the court of heaven and speak up for me. I know that my Redeemer lives. How did he know? Because the Holy Spirit was living in him and he had been given this gift of faith. And he goes on to say something even more shocking. He says, even though God slay me, yet will I trust in him. That is faith. Faith is living with absolute confidence that God is trustworthy. He is who he says he is. His promises are absolutely watertight. The future he has prepared for us cannot be changed by whatever happens in the world, whatever happens in our lives, the the promises of God are certain and sure. We are on our way to heaven. Hallelujah. Faith opens up adventures of partnership with God. It isn't just about what is to come. If you read Hebrews 11, they had some amazing adventures, didn't they? You know, God telling Noah there's going to be a catastrophic flood, build an ark. Now that's pretty strange. That's pretty weird. We could do a whole other sermon on that. It's a lovely story, isn't it? The idea that you'd build this enormous boat in the backyard of your house when you're miles away from water and all your neighbours are telling you, you are crazy. That's an adventure with God, isn't it? <laughs> I remember when I first uh, realised that I was off to Tanzania uh, to take part in a project which just been such a privilege to be involved with. Um, I didn't even want to travel anywhere in this country. I was almost scared of traveling. And God opened up such a wonderful way. And I've seen uh, faith exercised every single day in that wonderful project. Still God blesses and I just don't know where all the stuff comes from to keep this ministry sustained. It's a wonderful experience to be a partner with God in faith in this life. Um, faith opens up adventures of partnership with God. And this faith can face doubts. This faith can live with the unanswered questions. This faith can have troubles coming upon us, yet still stand strong. Because the destination is absolutely certain. And faith reassures us that is so. And so, as we end this message this morning, as Hebrews 11 turns into Hebrews 12, I remind you, it says this, Therefore, therefore, because of what we've learnt in Hebrews chapter 11, as it turns into Hebrews chapter 12, even though in those days the verses were not written in, but for us it's very helpful, because it says, therefore, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. I pray that you will indeed do that and that God will bring you into many wonderful adventures of faith in this life and that together one day we will rejoice in sharing the wonderful thing that he has prepared for those who love him. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. So much encouragement, so much for us to remember and to be encouraged by. Um, one of your references was to Hebrews chapter 12, second verse. Mine is the same chapter, first verse. The great crowd of witnesses. And we are thankful to God for the saints that went before us, biblical and non-biblical, who showed us by example and who led the way. And the other thing I thank you for, and I'm sure it's relevant to other people as well, clarifying the Christian definition of hope. We have a hope, we have a surety, a guarantee of God's inheritance. And if we follow him and we go by what he has said, we know God's promises never fail then we are on our way to heaven. Praise God. Praise God. And so we're going to end our service with an, uh, an affirmation and a declaration 
of the hope we have in Jesus. We have a song, there is hope in the mighty name of Jesus. I bless you, have a good week, and we will meet again in some form next week. God bless you all. Teenage.